everybody. This is the latest episode of Bold Leaders in Learning. I'm your host, Brandon Busty, Chief Partnership Officer and Global Head of Learn, Work, Innovation at Kaplan. And I'm delighted to have uh, Jamie Marisotis with me today. Jamie is the CEO of Lumina Foundation uh, and also the author of his latest book, Human Work. Uh, and so we are going to be uh, talking about the book today and the topic of human work. But Jamie, uh, first of all, thanks for joining us. And would love to just have you introduce yourself in terms of a little bit more about your own personal background and anything you want to say about Lumina Foundation uh, for, for the folks who may not be as familiar with it. Thanks, Brandon. It's great to be with you. Really uh, looking forward to this conversation. You know, look, I'm, I'm, a, uh, I'm a product of the system that you and I have spent our careers trying to influence and improve. Um, I'm the first in my family to, to go to college, uh, come from an immigrant family. And now, I always tell people that uh, my path to Bates College in Maine um, was more um, luck um, than strategy. My parents didn't know what college was, except for one thing, that me and my three brothers were going. That was the only thing that they knew. Yeah. And, you know, they worked very hard to, to get us there. And, you know, so I've spent my career uh, first as a policy analyst, uh, then eventually running a, a bipartisan federal commission, starting the Institute for Higher Education Policy, and now since 2008 at Lumina, sort of focusing on this idea that education after high school is critical to our economic, social, and cultural well-being as, as a society. And, you know, Lumina is a, was a great organization when I got here in 2008. It was focused on improving access and success in higher education. And uh, the focus that I think I've brought in the last 14 years to Lumina is this idea that a large philanthropic organization, we're one of the, you know, 100 or so largest private foundations in the country, um, can be focused on a single issue and be very deliberate about what it's trying to achieve. So since 2008, we've aimed all of our work around trying to catalyze the country towards a time-limited quantitative goal, 60% of Americans having a high quality degree, certificate, or other credential by 2025. And that idea of a foundation like Lumina trying to catalyze systemic change at that level is something that I feel very strongly about as someone who raised money from foundations for many years and now runs a large uh, foundation. It is something that I think American philanthropy needs to do given the enormous scale of the challenges that we face as a society. Yeah, and you certainly, well, I mean, you and I share uh, a love of higher education. Uh, and also, you know, I think our, our folks that have also looked at it as, um, you know, in a, in a critiquing sort of way in terms of what kinds of things need to be improved about higher education. and. Um, so, you know, obviously, we'll, uh, we're certainly gonna have a fun conversation today. You know, I wanna turn to the book, um, Human Work. Obviously, there's a lot of talk about, and there has been for, for several years, about robots and artificial intelligence and how this is going to uh, take away jobs and be a threat to human uh, work. And what you've done in this book, which I think is, uh, which is just a terrifically well-researched and well-written book is, start to kind of paint a different kind of picture, one where uh, humans and robots and AI are actually working together and you make a distinction about the things that are uniquely human work, even in this age of growing artificial intelligence and, and, and robotics in the workplace. And you make several good points about that, which we'll talk about. But one of the things you open up in the book, which I just thought was a great story and anecdote, was the, uh, the story of Joel Lewis and the cobots. And I would love to just have you Tell that to our audience briefly. Yeah, let, let me just uh, underscore what you said, because it goes back to our conversation that we just talked about, right? Which is that I've spent my life at this intersection of learning and work, you know, trying to make it more inclusive, serve more people, et cetera. But, you know, throughout my career, this is my 30th year, by the way, as the CEO of, of a national organization, you know, people have been asking this question much more um, loudly as time has gone by, which is, so Jamie, what, what's education for? Tell me what, what is the purpose of higher education and, and what is it really all about at the end of the day? And as I started to think about it, I said, I think we need to answer that question as an industry. And as you pointed out, my partial answer to the question is that it's to prepare people for the work that only humans can do because we, we all know, we understand what's going on, right? You know, work is changing because of AI and, and, and technology. And, you know, we have to be focused on what it is that makes us uniquely human in terms of our contributions uh, to work. We know what machines can do, they're good at repetition speed pattern, but humans have all of these traits, right? They have the, the ability to 
Um, you know, understand the capabilities and limitations of machines, but we also have all of these skills and, and abilities, empathy and ethics and ability to collaborate and, and all of these other things that make us uniquely human. So you know, this idea from, from the book that I talk about, about how we should be thinking about human work as complementary to what the machines are doing. It's not that the machines are going to come along and, and take our jobs. They will, by the way, take some of our jobs. Um, technology is always yeah. ultimately created more jobs than it destroys, but it does destroy jobs. And that's certainly gonna be a part of this process. But you know, Joel Lewis is a really good example of the kind of worker that I think we should be focusing on because I try to tell the stories of these real workers in the book from today, not some sort of future oriented uh, right. perspective. You know, Joel has been working on the line at Cummins Engine Company um, in Indiana for, for several decades. He was essentially stuffing uh, pistons into diesel engines for, for Dodge Ram pickup trucks. And you know, a couple of decades into his job, all of a sudden the assembly process started to change. And all of a sudden um, his coworkers were these collaborative robots, right? So these are smart machines that are made possible by advances in sensor technology and AI. And they're essentially literally sharing the same space working side by side. So it has all kinds of implications in terms of What's your job? What are you doing that's uniquely different from, from, the, from the machine? Joel, actually, part of Joel's job is to train the cobots to literally be part of the, the ongoing uh, training and, and uh, programming of the, of the cobots. And you know, uh, the HR team at Cummins has had to answer all kinds of interesting questions, which is, you know, how do we make the workplace in a manufacturing facility safe and comfortable and, and and effective for our workers. Well, one way you do that is that you make the machines do the things that are hard and the humans do the things that only humans can do. That's that complementarity that I think is, is critical to thinking about human work. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's an exciting way, I think, for all of us to think about this. I mean, you're right, there will be some jobs that will be eliminated as a result of it. You're right too on the point that technology has always had that influence, right? And that there's also some good research that the net impact is that new technologies usually end up creating more jobs than destroying, right? Improving, you know, the overall economy and the economic pie. And so I think that's a, that's a hopeful view in terms of how to look at it. It also gives us real specific thoughts on what we need to do, the kinds of things we need to teach, the kinds of, you know, uh, pedagogies that we need to deploy as we think about preparing people for this human work. And so as, as you know, we'll, we'll get into that because you were very articulate about some of the attributes of that. And I think that'll help, you know, our whole audience kind of think about it through their own lens, whether they're in K-12 or higher ed or, or corporate learning. But before I do, you know, you, you made some really big points that were near and dear to research I was involved with at Gallup as well around, um, you know, the purpose of work, how work is not just about a paycheck, right? That people all around the world, this isn't just in the United States, think about their purpose through the lens of work in many ways. And I always have been frustrated by, you know, the very narrow conversation about jobs and how much money you make. We know there's an important threshold of economic earnings that matters for somebody, but you go to well-known well-being research uh, that's been done. The Nobel Prize winning work has been done around and well-being, you know, how people rate and evaluate their lives doesn't really increase over $75,000 a year in earnings, statistically speaking, right? And, you know, you make uh, several points about the purpose of work in the book. And you also talk about one of the studies uh, that's been known as the Deaths of Despair study. Would just love to have you talk a little bit more about that, because I thought that was a, a, an enlightened way of thinking about jobs, work, and careers. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're making a, a really important point about, you know, at the end of the day, for us as humans, work matters, right? You know, you, you sort of sort through all the, what do the machines do? What can they do? What can't they do? What do humans do? What, what can they do? What can't they do? But at the end of the day, purpose and meaning and dignity are very important parts of, of who we are as, as human workers. And we get personal satisfaction. We get social mobility. Um, we get dignity. We get all of these things out, out of work. And actually, you know, your your former stomping grounds, your your colleagues at Gallup have done this research for many years that shows that um, having both real meaning and the financial stability that you were talking about in work is essential to that to that well being, to happiness and, and life life satisfaction. Even for the lowest wage workers, uh, you know, I, I make this point in the book, and some people have challenged me 
But over the course of many years, Gallup has, has demonstrated this point that even for the people in the bottom income quintile, they say they're willing to give up some money for meaning. You know, they need stable and predictable pay, but they yeah. also want to have a, a sense of, of purpose. And so I think that's that's really important. And if you don't have that, you know, to the to the point about the uh, the um, the um, Angus Deaton of research, you know, I think it's extraordinary to think about the fact that people who don't have that meaning and dignity and purpose because they haven't been able to participate in the, the um, uh, economic uh, livelihood of a nation that is increasingly becoming more productive, uh, you know, more focused on using technology to drive innovation and change. Um, those people are the people who have had the high rates of suicide, the drug abuse, you know, the issues that, that ultimately relate to the fact that they feel like their lives are fundamentally not repairable, but they are. The point is they're repairable with a high quality education that prepares them for life and for work, right? The same language that, that you and I have used for a number of years yeah. with those human work skills, that ability to be a critical thinker and a problem solver and a communicator, someone who can collaborate, be empathetic, et cetera. All of those things drives success for these individuals. And uh, you probably saw, uh, you and I both tracked the research really well that the um, uh, American Association of College and Universities, AACNU, did uh, another version of their employer survey. And those same things keep coming up for employers. What do they value the most in terms of, of their employees? It is those generalizable traits the ability to work in teams, the ability to problem solve, the ability to analytically reason, you know, all of those things, the, to be empathetic, all of those things are the things that employers say they need and that workers say they desire as part of what they want out of work. Yeah. And, and on that point, you know, you in the book, you describe the kinds of roles that human work uh, you know, kind of links to. And, you, you know, you had some descriptions in there. You called them the helpers and the bridgers and the integrators and the creators. Could you just uh, tell us a little bit more about uh, those roles that you see as, as kind of critical around the human work aspect? Yeah, let me say one thing, which is that um, every, every paper book um, article that I've read about the work of the future has um, uh, another um, uh, typology, another <laughs> set of ways to categorize right. uh, workers. So I'm, I'm certainly not intending to, to do that, but I thought it would be helpful to just, uh, because many people in thinking about this concept of human work, um, they think narrowly and they think right. that uh, it's a very narrow set of things. So, you know, I tried to say, look, there are these four categories and they're not hierarchical, right? So the, the helpers are people who are engaged in occupations that involve deep personal interaction with people. So, you know, think about your therapist or, the person who's doing customer service, right? Someone yeah. who's really sort of got to understand what the problem is you're solving. You know, um, it's it, you know, most people are not satisfied pressing three and working through a chat bot to try to figure out what the what the, what the problems are. They want to talk to a real person, and those people have to have to have um, those skills that involve deep personal interaction. The bridgers are people who work in occupations that involve the connection between people and technical tasks and systems. And um, there's lots of examples there, but you know, again, from a sort of contemporary, not sort of future looking, this would be like sales managers, right? Sales managers, they really got to understand the product or the service, whatever it is they're, they're selling, but you've got to interact with the people. You got to close the deal. You've got to be able to, to, you know, to manage the human relationship. The integrators are where I think there, there will be a lot of, of human work in the future, because these are the people that involve integration of knowledge and skills from a very wide range of fields and then apply them in a highly personal way. So your social workers and your teachers, you know, people who, who we need, who we rely upon to, again, synthesize that information from a broad array of fields and, and bring them all together. And then the last group I describe is creators, which involves this combination of highly technical skills and pure creativity. Because, you know, at the end of the day, um, creativity is a, a combination of both innate and developed ability, right? And so creativity might be someone who's a game developer or the creators might be choreographers or things like that. So, so those buckets, I think, describe human work in a more concrete way that allows people to understand that this is not about some sort of narrow set of things that humans are going to be in a, in a sort of, of a, you know, this, this is just my area and the machines are gonna do all that other stuff. There's a lot of potential in human work. And I do think 
uh, technology is going to create more opportunities than it destroys at the end of the day. Yeah, and those broad categorical role descriptions, you know, you can see many, many jobs that fit within those uh, descriptions. So it does, it does broaden your view of human work. Uh, it allows you to see it, you know, kind of connected in terms of real examples, like you've just described, like what kinds of roles. And oh yeah, there's a lot of different jobs that fit in that, you know, connector uh, or that, you know, the helper or bridger role. And so um, you also talked a lot about a concept called wide learning in the book. And I thought it would be helpful to just, uh, you know, have you talk a little bit more about that as well. Yeah. So, you know, again, um, more, more typologies, but I, you know, I thought it would be helpful to talk about the distinction between what people say when they talk about machines, right? So machines are good at, you know, and many people, you know, um, understand this terminology now, uh, machines use deep learning, right? These are techniques in which the machines use algorithms to dig deeper and deeper um, into data sets that allow them to analyze and, and generate the, uh, the, the, the knowledge development, if you will, that, that they're doing. But, you know, human work requires wide learning, right? And, and it includes, it's wide in time, wide in people and wide in content. So, you know, this idea that learning has to take place in a wide time context over the course of people's um, entire lifetimes, I really think it's essential uh, to, to, to human work. And it is what I describe in the book as a virtuous cycle, right? You have to repeat this many times over the course of the worker's life cycle in a way that gives them rewards along the way. So it's a, like a ratcheting over time, not stop out, go do some learning, then come back right. to work, then stop out, go back. No, it's an ongoing part of the process, but, but it is really sort of wide in, in, in time. Um, you know, then the second dimension is the, you know, it's wide in, in, in people. So, you know, um, wide learning, um, you know, is, is critical because human work has to represent the wide range of people, you know, who are diverse in terms of their race and their gender and their ethnicity and immigration status, et cetera, uh, because human workers have to reflect the totality of society for us to share in those, in those uh, uh, benefits, that well-being that you were talking about earlier. And then the third dimension, obviously, is the content of the learning, what people have to learn to be successful in this um, ecosystem of human work, if you will, represents that wide array of human traits and capabilities, the empathy and the ethics, the collaboration and the communication, all those things um, coming together. So, and, you know, to sort of go back to the to last point about, about meaning, the wide learning at the end of the day also closely connects to this idea that we want to serve others, right? We apply those energies and interests yeah. to make our communities and the world better. I mean, that's a key part of why we say as humans, uh, you know, work matters. So, so this, this human work paradigm that I describe in the book, I say earning, learning, and serving, that, that's the human work paradigm. They're all equally important. They happen together. And the key is that everybody's got to have the opportunity to, to, to do all three of those things. Yeah. That's great. It's, it's a bit of a segue to, you know, more specifically talking about higher education, right? And as you think about, you know, examples like the integrators, uh, you know, one of the things that, 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 you know, human work really falls into is being able to, you know, think across multiple domains and dimensions, right? And to combine technical and behavioral and certain things like that. And yet, you know, when you look at how many colleges and universities are organized, right, we continue to be organized in, in educational silos, right? We've got departments and we've got majors and, um, and certainly there's a trend towards multi or interdisciplinary work happening across that. But we still have a lot of work to do on things like that if we're really going to get to a place where graduates are leaving as, you know, real integrative thinkers. Um, you know, you, you have a quote in the book too that really struck me um, <laughs> because I, I agree with it, right? And I've said it in different ways, but the way you said it was uh, was, I think, really well crafted. And it's, I'll, I'll quote it. You, you talked about higher ed being divorced from the settings in which human work is actually performed. Ooh, uh, t tell, tell us a little bit more about that one, because I, I think I, it just it rings true. I think there are opportunities to improve and fix that. But um, what what were you meaning in that in that comment? Yeah, you know, two two things. You know, the first one is that you know we have spent decades, and again, you and I have both been at this for a while. We have spent decades in this debate about whether we are preparing people for work or for life, and it, and we've fundamentally talked past one another because we know that a good you know a good job and a good life you know good work and 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 well being 
are critical. They go together and preparing people for that is largely part of the same thing. So, but we've had this real push and pull um, between higher ed and I would say employers in saying, yes, we do, no, we don't when it comes to what we're preparing them for. The employers and higher ed have talked past each other in, in this conversation. And I think that you know higher ed is divorced from the reality of human work because in fact, what higher ed has wanted to call liberal learning or, or, or you know, uh, liberal arts institutions um, much of what they do is largely what we will need to be doing to prepare people for human work, except that it's got to be connected in those ways to the real technical skills that you need in order to be effective in this increasingly technology mediated world. So it's a both and is my point. And, you know, and I think it's really important that we focus on that and not spend more time talking past one another. And, you know, look, COVID has sort of put an exclamation point in all of this, right? Because sure. at the end of the day, COVID has accelerated all of these trends that, that we've seen. You know, we've seen the racial injustice and inequity. We've seen the issues related to, to the ways in which uh, people have been denied opportunities to, to the sort of, of, of a work that um, uh, does give you dignity and purpose and meaning. You know, so many of those essential workers, those frontline workers have been people of color and particularly women of color that I think um, you know have uh, we've shown a light on that problem probably in a in a in a more important way than we have in the past, and I think higher ed has to respond to this challenge and do a better job of preparing people for this human work future. Yeah, you know, and I've said it in different ways. I've given speeches on this. I've written articles about it. You know, you you use some of the same language. It's a it's a it's about trying to achieve a merger of learning and work, and you can you can talk about that through the lens of I'm a school. I'm a college or university, I'm an employer, right? Where uh, obviously if you're talking about K through 12, you might have some additional challenges to develop work integrative learning, but you can do that through project-based learning. You can do that through team, you know, student team projects, right? There's a lot of ways short of having them do an actual job to mimic a lot of what's happening in the real world of work. And, um, and then, you know, you go back to some of the research that the two of us helped kick off, you know, from the Gallup Purdue Index, Lumina Foundation was the seed funder for that whole initiative, right? And what we were right. looking for were what were the high impact aspects of college that really related to work success later. And, you know, these aren't going to surprise people. There were things like whether you had a job or internship during college that applied what you were learning in the classroom, right, where those synergies were taking place whether you worked on a long-term project that took a semester or more to complete, right? Where you were actually involved in producing something in a meaningful fashion. And so here's the, here, my frustration is, I feel like we know the formula, right? Like it's not a big secret about how you help, you know, students be more work ready or, you know, what, what the path to learn work innovation is, but we're still having a hard time scaling this. And like, where do you still see the major challenges and resistance toward this end game of a merger of learning and work? You know, I think part of it is just fear, fear of the unknown, right? I think that is, it is human nature that um, the kind of change we're talking about does mean significant changes in the way the, uh, the sector of higher education sees itself. Uh, but again, I come back to COVID has accelerated this, right? So you look at the environment that we're in now and the ways in which we now understand that the college application process has to change, that the ways in which we, the, the factors that we use to admit students to college and universities are gonna change, are gonna be accelerated, right? So this, in the selective institutions, the competitive institutions, this massive movement away from testing and to, to move into test optional policies means that the college and universities are scrambling, scrambling to figure out what it is they're really assessing in terms of the potential of students to do quote unquote college level work. Well, it gets at all of these things that you and I have been talking about, right? It's, it's are, the, are they prepared to, to um, develop their human traits and capabilities? And can they show that they've got the ability to not only possess, but develop their empathy and their ethics and their collaboration and their problem solving? It requires a very different set of strategies in terms of assessing, you know, again, for admissions purposes, but what we're gonna do in the college and universities is going to be very different. And, and I think, you know, um, the, the learning outcomes, a movement that we've faced in, in, in higher education that we've developed in the last 20 years has been extraordinarily important, but it's gonna to have to go through another phase shift, a much deeper phase shift 
that emphasizes, you know, what we've learned about racial uh, injustice and inequity, but also underscore or underscores the points here that we've got to be preparing people for this human work future. Yeah, and I'm encouraged. Obviously, a lot has happened as a result of the pandemic. A lot of uh, really bad things, right? Things that have been exposed and you know made much more painful and. But, you know, as we've all started to understand, there's also just a lot of changes that are happening as a result, some of which may lead ultimately to better outcomes where we rethink, you know, that, you know, we don't want to go back to the norm because the norm maybe wasn't working as well as it should have. And I've been encouraged in the midst of this that a lot of university leaders, I mean, in higher numbers than I've ever seen before, are talking very seriously about this learn work uh, type of integration, right? How they can improve the work readiness of graduates. And many of them still hold on importantly to the both and view that you, know, you mentioned, right? That it's both about these kind of classic aspects of the liberal arts and it is about being specifically skilled in certain ways and having work experience that somebody can draw from. So I, I'm encouraged, I'm seeing it in a lot of places. Kaplan's doing a lot of work with institutions that are doing things like integrating industry recognized credentials as part of a bachelor's degree, right? So um, I'm hopeful, you know, I, I, I wanted to make sure before we run out of time that, that I get to uh, one of the things that you comment on in the book is that you kind of diss the idea of lifelong learning, right? It's a term that's been used widely. In fact, this was a silly little project that I did. It's, it's actually the most used phrase in college mission statements is lifelong learning. And then you step back and you go, what does that really mean, right? So tell me your view on, on lifelong learning because uh, I've got a couple of comments as well, so. Yeah, I, I, let me just say one other thing before I get to the lifelong learning. I, I just think it's, it's so important to underscore this point here that in the talking past each other part of, of what's happened with, with higher ed and, and employers, we, we have to come to the conclusion here that it's pretty obvious that you can't do, you know, we'll call it training for lack of a better term for a job that is, you know, devoid of broader learning, right? Of this, of the broader um, integrative knowledge that we were talking about earlier. And you wow. can't have education devoid of preparing people for work, right? That's the part where we've, we, where we've missed each other. So the point is these things have to come together. And yeah, COVID is the largest unplanned um, educational innovation experiment in the history of, of our country in all likelihood. Yeah. And so it's, it's, um, it's incredibly important that we learn the lessons from this and apply them going forward. On the question of lifelong learning, you know, I've spent enough time with, uh, with people who have gone through um, these conversations who are sort of either they've never been a part of the, of the system. These are adult learners, which who are a big part of what we're focused on right now at Lumina in terms of short-term credentials, associate yeah. degrees and other things. These, these individuals, um, you know, sort of hear this term lifelong learning and they think, my God, they're talking about a life sentence, right? Yeah. They're talking about sentencing me to constantly having to go to some school and sit in a classroom. And that's not for me. That's not for me. So, you know, my view is that the language is wrong, right? It is not about lifelong. It's a dream for us in education, right? It's like, you know, an endless supply of customers. Cool. You know, that, that's wonderful. But for them, yeah. I think we've got to help them understand that there is that ratcheting process of learning and working and working and learning that gives you the rewards that you want. Because at the end of the day, it comes back to the point that you made earlier. It's about meaning. It's about serving others. It's about dignity. And that virtuous cycle of learning, earning, and serving can happen in the context of someone's entire lifetime journey through work. But it is not a lifelong learning journey to them. That just sounds terrible. Yeah. I think it's such an important thing to point out, you know, because they, you also made the point in the book that they hear that and they think, oh my gosh, expensive college, I can't afford that, right? There's yeah. a lot of things that go in their, in their minds when you, when you say lifelong learning. And one of the things I've, you know, talked about is that, you know, there, there's a question as to whether you can train somebody to be a lifelong learner versus there are people who are just naturally inquisitive and always want to soak up, you know, new insights and, you know, continue learning, right? So how much of it is innate? How much of it is actually trained, right? And, um, and, you know, and then the other thing I think we're getting wrong right now is that we're confusing lifelong learners in the, in the sense of those who are just interested in the intellectual fulfillment of learning, right? The fun of learning, the joy of learning versus those who are what I, what I would call 
the, the ones who are looking for the earnings, right? Which is, I want a better job. I want to make more money. I want to get that promotion. Those are very distinct archetypes of students. And I think I see a lot of well-intentioned efforts that just lump all that into one big category. Those are two very different types of learners, different motivational reasons. And so your point is, if we want to serve a larger number of people. It's very much in that category of show me the best, most effective, fastest pathway, least expensive pathway to improving my earnings and lot in life. And there's a lot of ways to do that. So, um, so I'm glad we've, uh, hopefully there's some changing dynamics in that language, much like, you know, soft skills and some of the other terms that we throw out there all the time and, uh, you know, probably do ourselves a disservice by not being more clear about. So, um, so Jamie, I know we've literally hit the 30 minute marker. I always feel like these conversations are 10 minutes, not 30. Uh, it's been a real pleasure having you on. Uh, I look forward to, you know, reading your evolving thinking in, in this space. And uh, certainly thank you to you and the Lumina Foundation for all the incredible leadership that you've provided for our country. And um, uh, for those of you who are interested next week, I'm going to have my colleague Andy Tempty on talking about his book, The Balancing Act. Uh, which we'll talk a lot about this in a different way, about balancing the technical and the behavioral and the human and the, and the technical. So uh, anyway, Jamie, thank you again very much. And I look forward to staying in touch and, uh, and seeing your evolving work here. Thanks very much, Brandon. Great to be with you. And thanks very much for your leadership and particularly the thoughtful way in which uh, we're having to talk about these very complex issues. Really appreciate it.